If you search online for how the nucleus was discovered, you probably bump into Rutherford's gold foil experiment, where a beam of alpha particles hit a piece of gold, and then the position of the alpha particle is found on the screen that is wrapped around the gold. Now, there was an experiment done like this in 1913, but it wasn't done by Rutherford, nor did it inspire Rutherford to discover the nucleus. In fact, it was done to verify Rutherford's theory about the nucleus that he had published two years earlier. The real influential experiment was done in 1909 and involved eight different metals, not just gold, but was far simpler. So simple, in fact, that Rutherford gave it to an undergrad as busy work. Ready for the real story? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. It all started in 1899. That is when Rutherford, who was a graduate student at Cambridge, noticed that radiation from uranium was complex and that some was easy to block and some wasn't. He labeled the easiest blocked radiation as alpha radiation and the other radiation as beta. Rutherford then got a job as a professor at McGill University where he had, as he put it, a swell lab and proceeded to do a lot of amazing work that I talked about in my last video. You should check it out. In 1904, an Australian named William Bragg published his theory that alpha particles travel through thin solids without any deviation. In general, Rutherford thought very highly of Bragg's work, but in this one point he differed. See, Rutherford thought everything was full of electrons, teeny tiny little electrified particles that were so small that you could get really close to them and therefore feel a pretty strong electric force. J.J. Thompson, Rutherford's advisor at Cambridge, had discovered electrons, which he called corpsicles, back in 1897. And by 1904, Thompson had concluded that, quote, atoms consist of a number of negatively electrified corpsicles enclosed in a sphere of uniform positive electrification. This was colloquially called the plum pudding model of atoms, where the electrons were the raisins, or if you're a Brit, the plums in a positive pudding. At around this time, Rutherford had become convinced that alpha particles were positive, had twice the charge of an electron, and around 7,000 times the mass. Despite this, Rutherford thought that the tiny light electrons could push the heavy alpha particles electrically because they could get so close to each other, just not by much. In 1906, he published an experimental proof of his theory. Rutherford put a small piece of radioactive wire in a groove and then had the beam of alpha particles from the wire go through a small slit and illuminate a photographic plate. He then covered half the slit with a mica screen. The beam that went through the mica was a little bit more spread out than the beam that didn't, by about 2%. Rutherford concluded that, quote, such a result brings out clearly the fact that atoms of matter must be the seat of very intense electrical forces, a deduction in harmony with the electronic theory of matter. In 1907, Rutherford, who felt left out in the colonies of Canada, got a job at the University of Manchester, where he met a young German scientist named Hans Geiger. Geiger and Rutherford then determined that a screen made out of phosphorescent zinc sulfide would glow when hit with an alpha particle, and only alpha particles, in a process called scintillation. Rutherford hated scintillation and left it to the younger and more patient Geiger, writing a friend that, quote, Geiger is a demon at the work of counting scintillation and can count at intervals for a whole night without destroying his equanimity. I damned vigorously and retired after two minutes. There was another problem with scintillation. The doubt, as Rutherford put it, at once arises whether every alpha particle produces a scintillation. Therefore, Rutherford turned to an electric method. Now, alpha particles have a charge of 2E, or twice the charge of an electron, which is very, very small, way smaller than can be measured by an electrometer. Luckily, Rutherford's friend from his time with J.J. Thompson, a man named John Townsend, had found that if he put gas at a low pressure under really high voltage until it almost sparked, just a little charge would create an avalanche of charges, and so a little charge could be magnified. In 1908, Rutherford wrote, quote, under such conditions, the ionization produced in the gas by the alpha particle is magnified 2,000 times by collision. The effect of each alpha particle is marked enough to show an audience. By July of 1908, Rutherford and Geiger published that, quote, the number of scintillations is within the limit of experimental error 
equal to the number of alpha particles falling upon it, as counted by the electric method. Around the same time as their electrical experiments, Geiger was also studying the number of alpha particles that were emitted by a substance by scintillation. When he noticed that the alpha particles were a little bit scattered by air, Geiger remarked upon it to Rutherford, and Rutherford remembered his experiment with mica screen. He then told Geiger to redo the experiment with the scintillation method so it could get an exact distribution of the alpha particles as they went through a thin material. Geiger thus put radium in a small lead evacuated cone where one end was covered in thin mica that let the alpha particles escape. He then had the beam of particles go through a small slit that could be covered with foil and then examined the alpha particles that hit a phosphorescent screen with a microscope that could be moved up or down about 10 millimeters. In this way, Geiger produced smooth curves of the position of the alpha particle diverted by thin metals. The next year, a 20-year-old undergraduate named Ernest Marsden joined the research group. What happened next is best described by Rutherford himself. One day, Geiger came to me and said, don't you think young Marsden ought to begin a small research? No, I had thought so too. So I said, why not let him see if any alpha particles can be scattered through a large angle? I may tell you in confidence that I did not believe that they would be. Since we knew that the alpha particle was a very fast, massive particle with a great deal of energy. Then I remember two or three days later, Geiger coming to me in great excitement and saying, we've been able to get some of the alpha particles coming backwards. So what did Marsden do? Well, he used the same cone of radioactive materials before but had it hit a foil of metal at an angle and then have the reflected alpha particles hit a screen that was examined by a microscope. He also placed a lead barrier between the screen and the radioactive source so that everything he saw had to reflect off the foil. Geiger and Marsden then experimented with eight different metals and found that a few alpha particles would bounce off any thin metal, where the heavier the metal, the more alpha particles would reflect. This is not to imply that a lot of alpha particles were reflected. In fact, in the same experiment, they found that only one in 8,000 alpha particles would reflect off a piece of platinum. Still, why would any heavy alpha particle reflect off a thin metal? It didn't make any sense. Rutherford recalled, quote, it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. Ow! Rutherford thought about it for well over a year and by December of 1910 wrote a friend, I think I can devise an atom much superior to JJ's. It will count for the reflected alpha particles observed by Geiger and I generally think will make a fine working hypothesis. Rutherford's logic, according to his own words, was, quote, I realized that the scattering backwards must be the result of a single collision. And when I made calculations, I saw it was impossible to get anything of that order of magnitude unless you took a system in which the greater part of the mass of the atom was concentrated in a minute nucleus. On March 7, 1911, Rutherford published an article where the atom consisted of, quote, a positive charge NE at its center, surrounded by a distribution of negative electricity NE, uniformly distributed within a sphere of radius R. Rutherford then concluded from the experimental results of Geiger and Marsden that the platinum nucleus had a charge of about 100 E, or 100 times the charge of an electron, and the nucleus was about 10,000 times smaller than the atom itself. He was startlingly close. We now think that platinum has a charge of 78 E and the nucleus is around 100,000 times smaller than the atom itself. That is ridiculously small. If the atom were expanded to the size of a cathedral, the nucleus would only be about the size of a fly. But a fly that holds 99.9997% of the weight. Or to put it the other way, atoms, and therefore all matter, contains 99.9999999999999999% material that is only filled with 0.0003% of the mass. So basically, almost everything is filled with almost nothing. So if we're all almost nothing, why don't I just fall through the floor? It's because of those teeny tiny electrons in everything. See, the electrons in the atoms in your shoes 
push against the electrons and the atoms in the floor when they get close enough to each other. You're not really touching the floor or anything really. You're actually hovering above it just a tiny bit due to electrical forces. Crazy, huh? Back in 1913, Geiger and Marsden did conduct a gold foil experiment, although it wasn't done with a wraparound screen, but instead a microscope coated with a screen that could be moved in the full circle. That gold foil experiment validated Rutherford's conclusions and proved that the nucleus was positive, something that Rutherford was pretty convinced about, but it was nice to have validation. Rutherford's model created a lot of interesting questions. One of the biggest had to do with the positive nucleus and the negative electron. Opposites attract. What keeps the negative electrons from being sucked in the positive nucleus? Even if they're spinning around the nucleus like planets, they are accelerating charges, spinning as a form of acceleration. And according to Maxwell's laws, they should be creating electromagnetic waves, which would cause the electrons to lose energy and then spiral into the nucleus. In other words, according to the laws of classical physics, Rutherford's atoms should just implode. But we exist. So either Rutherford was wrong or classical physics doesn't work on the atomic scale. This is why in July of 1913, a young Danish man named Niels Bohr, who was working for Ernest Rutherford, created the first quantum mechanical view of the atom, the Bohr model. In this model, Bohr used the results from a 1900 paper about black body radiation written by a man named Max Planck. But to tell that story and the story of quantum mechanics in general, I first want to take a step back and talk about the man who came up with the idea of black body radiation in the first place. This is a fabulous story about a tiny man and his large spacey friend who transformed our world with a prism and literally got gold from the sun, literally. How Kirchhoff and Bunsen discovered spectroscopy, the systematic study of the color from elements, and that led them to discover black body radiation is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Thanks for watching my video. If you haven't watched my last video about Rutherford, you should definitely check it out. Also, my next video about Bunsen and Kirchhoff is my favorite story of all of science. The science is great, it's simple, it's weird, it's cool. They're both such interesting characters. It's just fabulous. You totally should check it out. If you want to, please subscribe. Also consider being a patron and then you get my videos one day early and you get to be part of my community. There's a link down below. If you're too broke to be a patron, then consider joining my email list and then you at least get the videos one day early. Also, feel free to share it on social media or give it a thumbs up or make a comment. Whenever you make a comment, I try to respond to you. Okay, thank you so much to my patrons and have a great day. Bye now.